Welcome back, everybody. It's time for another edition of Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast here on this Tuesday. You've had a day to rumorate on the Raiders' 32-13 loss to the Pittsburgh Steelers at Allegiant Stadium. We're back here to talk about it and talk about moving forward as well. Scott Colbranson, your host, along with my co-host and partner in crime. His name is Mr. Mo Moten, senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report, also Raiders columnist, at sportsnot.com, you can also catch him during the week, which will always give you the dates, on uh, TNT Sports on True TV, where he is an NFL analyst as well. And sometimes he's a part-time chef, but he does pop-up restaurants. You just don't know where he's going to be. But anyway, he's here. That's how talented he is. You can follow him on x.com, at Mo Moten. I am at LV Gully. And just a reminder, the video, if you're watching us on video, we have a huge video audience we love it. It's not the biggest video audience in Raider Nation content creation, but it's a really good audience. They're always there, always in the chat. If you're following us on video, the video is brought to you by our good friends at BetUS. In fact, if you use the code YouTube150, I'm giving you a little secret here, YouTube150, you go to BetUS and you sign up for account, your first deposit up to $2,000, guess what? They're going to give you 150% bonus. That's right. For every $100 you put in, you're getting 150. Mo and I are giving you free money. So go do it at BetUS. And again, thanks to them for bringing us and bringing you the video. Okay, Mo, we haven't had a chance to talk to you. Mo and uh, Murph and I did the post game show, and you know, Murph got his fan stuff off his chest, which was great. I think he was reflecting a lot of the thoughts of Raider Nation out there, at least a good percentage of them. And, um, you know, we're back here today, and I watched on Monday the the Antonio Pierce press conference, and um, it's just plain and simple, Mo. I think I, I'm trying to get it as simple as possible so we can start a discussion, and that is just overall things with this team. I don't care if it's offense, if it's defense completely, if it's the coaching staff, if it's the planning, if it's special teams – Nothing seems to be working as intended right now. The Raiders still don't have an identity. They're not sure who they are. Um, they're tentative when it comes to play calling. Their play calling isn't working offensively. Um, man, it's just sort of, I'm not trying to pile on. I'm not trying to make people feel worse, Mo, but it's just not working right now. I'll tell you who the Raiders are. They're a four or five win poorly coached football team that has no offensive identity whose defense is regressing because of partially because of injuries or without two of your top pass rushers and Malcolm Kuntz and Christian Wilkins. And they're going nowhere in 2024. Fans, listen to me. I know that's starting out with, I guess you would call it negativity, but it is what it is. I have eyes. You have eyes. We can all see the product on the field isn't up to par. Antonio Pierce, after the game, has said, got to coach better, got to play better. But we've heard this song and dance before with previous head coaches. I talked about this on social media. It's the same message with a different coach, and nothing is changing on the field. So why would we expect anything to change going forward, especially with the injuries they have on both sides of the ball? Yeah, and Mo, that's what I'm interested in. And I, I saw somebody put this out. It was it was one of the writers at one of the sites. I forgot which one, so excuse me for not giving you credit here. But in, in essence, they said, you know, if you look at last year with Josh McDaniels and you look at this year – with uh, Antonio Pierce, in some ways, things are either the same or worse in some cases. Uh, and I'm not talking about not liking the guy who's coaching. I'm talking about just in general with how this team is playing. This team doesn't tackle well. This team doesn't block well offensively. Obviously, they can't run the ball like they thought they were going to be able to. We talked a, a lot about Antonio Pierce and his focus on physicality and violence and all this kind of stuff. And this team uh, looks about as as tough. I'm not, not everybody now, but looks as tough as yogurt, man. I just don't see the intensity. Uh, we have players like Jack Jones who kind of walked it back a little bit on Monday, but, you know, taking frustration out on fans, on X.com, on social media. You have misunderstandings with, with Max Crosby pushing his coach on the sideline, which was not really a push, he says. Like, all this weird stuff. But And I don't think it would have been an issue other than 
what we've seen in the first six weeks is we've seen all this dysfunction, the Devontae Adams issue, where we still don't know where we're at with that. Michael Mayer obviously taking care of personal issues. That's different. And so you got to you pray for the guy and hope he's OK. But he's away from. So all this stuff swirling around this team. Remember, we heard a lot about Antonio Pierce, the coaches, excuse me, the players saying that they wanted him. They wanted stability. They wanted a guy to come in. This was one of our own and we wanted blah, blah, blah. They've had anything but stability in the season so far, Mo. It's been a roller coaster ride, to, to put it mildly. But you talked about the, the similarities between the team under Antonio Pierce and the team under the previous head coach and Josh McDaniels. Now, what was the problem that we talked about last year that the Raiders couldn't score 20 points under Josh McDaniels, right? Remember that? Yes. This year, this year, aside from the Ravens game, they have not scored 20 points while it's been competitive. I know they had some cosmetics with the Carolina Panthers game to score 22. I get that. But those were garbage time points. Right. When the game is on the line, when it's competitive and the game is hanging in the balance, the Raiders struggle to score 20 points. Even in their win against the Cleveland Browns, they just hit 20. So we're seeing the same offensive problems we saw last year with a supposedly an upgrade supposedly at an offensive coordinator and Luke Getzey will get into him in a moment, but this team has no direction, no identity and no short-term future. We'll see what they do in the draft. Cause that's now where I'm looking toward because this mm -hmm. season right now for me with all the, as I said, with all the injuries, Devonte Adams probably on the way out with the offensive coordinator they have, this is a four or five win team five. If they're lucky, I know I said, you know, I was hitting the six. We were and up at seven over. and eight. Yeah, we were up at seven and eight. But if you had told me before the season that you're going to lose Malcolm Kuntz before you even take the field in week one, Devontae Adams is going to ask out in September. And you're going to lose your the, 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 the one free agent that you spent the most money on. You're going to lose him, Christian Wilkins, by early October. I would have told you, yeah, this is a probably a four or five win team. Right, right. But this and the, is where we are. And the injuries, like, listen, th that's not a coaching fault. That's not a GM fault. That just, that's how the game goes, right? So it, I want to make it clear that I don't blame the Raiders for injuries, but every team has injuries. I heard a lot of people, as I was talking about Aiden O'Connell in this game against the Steelers, saying that, hey, look, he was efficient. That's okay. Efficient is okay, but he wasn't electric. He wasn't a quarterback who's going to take the team on their shoulders and win the game, which is in the NFL – what you see with winning teams. If you look at winning teams like Lamar Jackson in Baltimore, like Buffalo and like Kansas city and these other teams, what their quarterbacks do is they can make up for deficiencies in other areas with their talent. Right? So that's why it's so important to get a franchise quarterback. But I heard a lot of people say, well, he, you got to give Aiden O'Connell a break. I mean, he doesn't have his top two receivers. Well, you know what? Remember CJ Stroud last year as a rookie lost receivers had a bunch of no names. What did he do? So, so I, you can't make these excuses around the, the roster Mo. And this is one of the main points I wanted to make today. And I want to get you, I want you to check me if I'm wrong on this, but the Raiders are not losing games and getting boat run like they are. They're not just losing games by two, three points here and there. And they're close like they've done in the past. They're getting beat. I mean, it's not even close as my good friend Irv calls it, a molly whopping, right? You're getting molly whopped. And that is not because of their roster being so much deficient or being so different or so much less than, for example, the Pittsburgh Steelers roster or the Carolina Panthers roster. They're getting beat because they have terrible penalties. They have huge amount. They lead the league in turnovers, okay? They're now minus nine in turnover ratio, right? Minus nine, worst in the NFL. They have suspect play calling. They have all sorts of issues there. And don't get into the referee crap, blaming everything on the referees. I don't want to hear it anymore. You're playing bad football, Mo. And they're playing below, in my view, if you agree with me, they're playing below the talent that they have, meaning that they're not getting the most out of the talent they have. I'll say this. If the game was over after the first two drives, the race would be a competitive football team. <laughs> They come out well. They, they, it's clear yes. that they do their homework, and they, they're good on script. They're Those consistent with that. Drives, the first two drives, they're going to score a touchdown the first two drives. Yeah. The yeah. problem is that the next nine to ten drives, the offense gives them nothing once the script <laughs> is over. Then when you're asked to improvise and adjust, 
they can't do that. And and you're right, Scott. You, you talk about it's not the losing. Like, this team is not very good right now with the injuries that they have. Right. So I can understand them losing to better teams. Yes. But your friend Irv and I have the same lexicon vocabulary. They're getting molly whopped every week at home. Right. So I said this, that in all of, in, in all their losses, they've, they've lost by at least 12 points. And someone also quote tweeted me and said, they've also trailed by double digits in all of their games. So Ravens game, they trailed by double digits, but they came back. Guess the Browns early, they trailed by double digits, but came back and they held on to a lead. So this team just hasn't put together a complete game yet. And I don't think they will anytime soon, the way things are looking right now. So it's not about how they're losing, because because people are going to say, well, they're losing against better teams and they're losing because of injuries and this and this and that and the third. It's they're not even competitive. I'm not even asking yeah. for a win streak. They're not even competitive. The Steelers yeah. aren't an offensive juggernaut, Scott, coming into this game. They have their own issues. They had yeah. offensive line injuries. They have one receiver in George Pickens, and he didn't even have a spectacular game. The Steelers just basically bullied the Raiders, which is supposed to be their calling card when Antonio Pierce took over. They don't have that calling card anymore because they can't run the football outside of the Browns game. So, again, this team is – I'm not asking for a spectacular performance with the injuries around Aiden O'Connell. I'm just asking for a competitive football team, and we're not seeing it. No, we're not seeing it. And like you talked about with the Steelers on Sunday, I mean, they're, they were on their backup center who got injured early in the game. They were on the third string center, third string center. And, and the Raiders couldn't get to Justin Fields and Justin Fields didn't, Justin Fields didn't have a terrible game, but he also didn't have a very good game. It wasn't like he was on fire and just killing the Raiders. That's not how it went. So, so the, the, the Steelers overall, remember that game opened up as a one point game, right? The Steelers were favored because of the quarterback change and all that stuff. So you you understood that, even though it was at home. And then it moved, to think, I think, to three and went by kickoff. Uh, and and and, and this, this tells you, and again, you go back to Carolina, you go back to all these games where, yeah, they're in it in the first quarter, but past that, it's not even close. And that's not, again, I argue, and not everybody has to agree with me out there, it's not just the talent deficiency or the injuries. That's certainly part of it. But... Again, you're not competitive. You're you're keeping the ball for long periods of time on offense. The time of possession yesterday, unlike some of the earlier games in the season, was not that much different. But the Raiders can't get the ball in the red zone. And then when they do get in the red zone, they fumble the ball, right? We saw fumbles. We saw turnovers. We saw bad penalties. You can argue about if the rule is great or not on, on, the, on the roughing the passer. It was a roughing the passer call, okay? Pierce addressed it at the press conference. They said they teach it. He said, if you watch Max Crosby, when he hits somebody, he always rolls to one side. So Malcolm Butler, in that case, I understand it. I'm not faulting the guy because I think I'd do the same thing. But he didn't roll, so they're going to call that play. This team is not losing because the referees have some big mass conspiracy against them. This team is losing because they're not competitive. They, they don't have the coaching. They don't have the plan. Like you said, the scripted plays work great, Mo. But guess what happens in any sort of business, a football team, basketball team, whatever. Stuff happens in a game that changes your plan. So you have to be able to have multiple ways to go out and execute. It doesn't seem like they have that. It's funny because you, if you look at the box score, they were the Steelers and the Raiders were pretty equal in yards per play. The Steelers Correct. Four point seven yards per play. The Raiders four point six yards per play. So they were moving the ball in stretches. But you talked about it, it's the turnovers that 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 hurt them. Now people want to talk about the questionable calls. Yeah, the calls were questionable, and a lot of people want to blame the referees. And and I think that's that's not even the first one of the top three things that were wrong with the Raiders on Sunday. <laughs> the yeah. turnovers. The fumbles, the interception, the um, you have not challenging certain plays that could have been challenged. And even if you lose a challenge, you at least give it a shot. You give a sh you, you to take a look at it and review it just to give yourself a shot. Just game mismanagement and turnovers will kill you every time in a football game, whether you're moving the ball or not. Yeah. And game mismanagement. Explain this to me, Mo. Again, I'm not just trying to crap on the Raiders. So, so for all the listeners and viewers... This is not me just piling on. I really have these questions, which is Antonio Pierce. We knew he was inexperienced. Okay, cool. Marvin Lewis is there. How is this happening? Now, Marvin Lewis was a 500 coach. Don't fool yourself. That's what he was. He's two games over 500 in his career as an NFL head coach. Just the way it is. So you're not talking about Andy Reid here or somebody else like that. 
So you look at this, though. He's supposed to have these guys around him to help him. He's got one of the biggest, if not the biggest, coaching staff in the NFL. And yet there's all this mismanagement. And so if you're sitting there telling me today, and I said this on Sunday, Mo, there's multiple levels of failure here. I'm not blaming it all on Antonio Pierce because it's not all his fault. No, not even, not even close. But he manages the games. He doesn't challenge the play. They asked him about it after the game. Why didn't you challenge it? And he gave kind of a soft answer. And my impression from his answer was he didn't even think about it. So uh, whether I'm right or wrong, I don't know. But that's my impression of what he said. And so to me, you can't win football games. Your team can't progress. Remember I said that last week, my friend? I said, just want to see this team progress. Even if they lose, but they progress, then you can say, okay, Coaching's got it together. The players are listening. They're they're getting together. They're doing, they worked on tackling. Remember, they didn't have pads on at practice because he just wanted to work on tackling. He took it easy on the guys a little bit. And what happened? Missed tackles again. We're not seeing any improvement, Mo. Right. And it's it's gonna be a repeat, wash, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat, you know, press conference basically until it changes on the field. And Ted Pierce, as you said, just talked about Antonio. Uh, he said, look, we got to get back to the basics tackling technique hand placement pad level he talked about all the basics of football and we saw all the faults in their, in, the, in their fundamentals on last sunday and it's either the players aren't executing and or the coaching staff isn't teaching it the right way i don't know what they're doing at practice but if you're drilling these things into these players and it's not translating on the field then what is the problem because they're going to have to figure it out they got to figure it out. And I mean, look, we saw uh, to, to, for, for full credit, Divine Diablo came back, had a good Thank game, God. especially starting out. I mean, he was all over the field, had an interception that was negated because of the penalty. penalty. So want to give him that because it was a great, great play. He anticipated the throw. It was beautiful. Looked like a linebacker in that sl slot right there. But, but past that, it's just hard. And this is what I feel so bad for fans because as fans, like I said, you as much as you guys hate to lose – if you lose a close one or if you lose and there's a close play and, the, and, and a call decides it, then I can see blaming the, the referees. But if you look at the Raiders this year in the losses, it's all been them. It's all been deficiencies on their side. They're, it's not like this was a two-point game and a call changed it and the Steelers kick a field goal and it's over. No, that's not what I like. These games are not close. They're not close. The garbage points I don't even consider – because by that time, the other teams just packed it in and they're just waiting for the, the clock to expire. So this is the problem. And this is why you have to go, just like in a company or whatever, and I know some people hate when I say this, you got to go to the guy who's in charge, okay? Antonio Pierce is in charge. And as I said on Sunday, Mo, if they don't start showing something, then I start to really think that the one and done is a distinct possibility not yet. I'm not there yet, but I, I I don't have much confidence in Antonio Pierce to turn things around because I just haven't seen anything in in six weeks now that makes me believe that. So I'm going to say this again because I want to make it clear. I'm not advocating for firing Antonio Pierce mid-season. Nope. The show is not either. Say, and I say, I'll say this again. I've said this plenty of times already. If the Raiders continue to get their doors blown off by double digits, he is not going to survive and make it to 2025. Again, I wouldn't fire him in season. You let Antonio Pierce no. finish the season to see if he could turn it around. You give him a, you give him that grace. You give him that chance based on what he did last year. But if you're losing by 12, 15, 20 points consistently at home, I know that Rays don't have much home field advantage anyway. But if you're losing by that margin consistently, you are not going to make it back for the second season unless unless there are changes made. Because I know, I don't want to put this out here, Scott. A lot of people want to compare Antonio Pierce to Dan Campbell. Yes. And I said this on Twitter that Dan Campbell went 313-1 and won in his first season with the Lions as a full-time head coach. But you know what Dan Campbell and the Lions did after that 313-1 and season? They fired their offensive coordinator, Anthony Lynn, and they promoted Ben Johnson from tight ends coach to the offensive coordinator. So they probably sat Dan Quinn down and said, hey, Either you got, either you make changes or you got to go. And I think that's going to be the ultimatum for Antonio Pierce. Antonio Pierce, what are you going to do to improve this offense? Before we go into the free agency, before we get to the draft, what are you going to do to improve the, the efficiency, the schematics, the philosophy of this offense? And if you don't have a good plan, then we're going to have to let you go. And this is why I think Luke Getzey 
is probably going to be fired first. Yeah, and and listen, that question has not been asked of Antonio Pierce. Pieces of that question have been asked, but I, I was I was hoping that after what happened on Sunday, that on Monday we'd have Antonio Pierce come out and say, "Look, what's what we're doing on offense? It's just not working. It's just it's not working. We're not going to stay with the same plan. We're getting together this week. We're going to figure out how we're going to adapt and change." He didn't say that. So I, I don't know what's going on there. doesn't mean they're not doing it. I'll give him that. I'm going to give him benefit of the doubt because he isn't going to tell us crap. But but I just don't see anything changing because I haven't seen anything change from week one to week six. There has been no change on trying to do things differently. So to your point about Dan Campbell and firing, the, the thing is, I don't see anybody on the Raiders staff currently right now that would be somebody you want to elevate to that position, number one. And number two, to go out and get somebody, are they going to want to hook their star to Antonio Pierce, who, if this year goes like that and they have to fire their OC, um, will be on kind of thin ice, if you will, if that's how it goes. So it, it's a real interesting predicament for the Raiders and for Mark Davis, frankly, because what happens the rest of this year will have to be something I, I would think, again, if this team plays really hard, they lose games because they lack talent or because of injury, fine, you understand that. But if they lose like they've been losing, to your point, then I just don't even see why you would entertain the opportunity for Antonio Pierce to come back because he's not doing the best with what he has. Again, doesn't have to win, doesn't have to make the playoffs, but you got to show that you're improving and that you're willing to make changes when they need to be made change. All right, we're going to hit our first break here. When we come back, we're going to dive more into uh, what's going on with this team. How do they move forward? What, what could they do? to sort of improve. Uh, we'll talk about the quarterback situation. Obviously, Aiden O'Connell now starting. I think that's still the right move. We'll see. Does that is that going to last? Or are we going to see another change of heart by Antonio Pierce and this team? I don't know. We'll see. But we'll talk about that when we come back again here on Silver and Black today. And Odyssey Sports Original Podcast brought to you by, on video, our good friends at BetUS. Hey, everybody. It is Scott. And you know Mo and I talk about it on the show all the time. And that's putting a little bit of dough on the games, not only the Raider games, but NFL games. We also like to bet some baseball, a little bit of everything. And to do that, we go to our partners at BetUS. If you haven't bet yet with BetUS, you're missing out. Not only do they have a great world-class website to make those bets, mobile app as well, no matter where you're at, even for our fans in Nevada, you can do it there. But the most important thing is they really take good care of you. We're talking about customer service, you know, so many times today it's lost on companies, especially in this growing field of online gambling. But if you look at BetUS, not only do they have great payouts, great odds, and pretty much everything you wanna bet on, but they take care of you. You can in fact get a personal betting analyst to, to work with, an assistant to work with, your own personal assistant. They will assign you a person that you can reach out to and they'll help you with it. So that's what you wanna do. But I'm up here on the website just to show you how easy it is. And of course, I'm wearing my Padres stuff because the Padres are in the playoffs. But we look at football and I'll tell you what, you go through this website, you're able to see every game in the NFL. And this is what we do, you know, on our Thursday shows, you guys hear us do it, but you can get here, you can get the odds. Not only that, but you can also go into the tab here and says markets and you can bet uh, everything from the game, the halves to quarters to game props uh, and, and be able to really make the Sunday fun outside of the Raiders. We know uh, you're, you're ride or die with them and it's emotional. So I don't necessarily think you should bet on them, but nonetheless, you got to bet on something. You got to have some fun. And at Bet USA to do it. Not only that, the amazing thing about this too is guess what they do? Guess what? Because Mo and I went to bat for you guys. Yes, we went to bat for you. The BetUS will give you 150% signing bonus, sign up bonus uh, on your first deposit up to $2,000. That's right, you heard it, 150. So you put 100 bucks down, you're getting 150 bucks. And you also can deposit your second or third time, $125, uh, 125%. Bonus is basically what it is. So you put 100, you get 125. That's your next two deposits, deposits two and three, up to $2,000 as well. And all you got to do is use our special code here. It is YouTube150. Again, that is YouTube150 to get your 150% sign up bonus. This is an exclusive offer here on Silver and Black today from our boys, our girls over at BetUS, where the game begins. And 
Again, they will take care of you. They take care of us. You know, we don't just do ads and have partners on the show to do it. We do it with only people that we believe in that we would use. I'm not going to ever try to turn you on to a product I wouldn't use. And BetUS does that. But go do it. Check it out. You can bet anything you want from basketball, football, ice hockey, even politics. Look at this. I know we're talking about football, but if I want to bet on the U.S. politics, I go here and check this out. I think I can bet. Look, I can bet on the presidential election right there. The updated odds, Kamala Harris at minus 120, Donald Trump at minus 10. They don't have a point spread. <laughs> Get it? But anyway, you can bet on politics. I know that's a dicey situation to talk about, but all these type things, great parlays, you name it. Again, got to remind you, using this special code, from us here at Silver and Black today from our friends at BetUS. YouTube 150, 150% sign-up bonus on your first deposit up to $2,000 and 125 on the next two deposits up to $2,000 as well. Again, YouTube 150 from BetUS, the official sportsbook of Silver and Black today. Go get them. Welcome back. Silver and Black today an Odyssey Sports Original Podcast talking about your Las Vegas Raiders Mo Moten, Scott Branson, back with you. We're running through all of this, and we certainly appreciate you being with us. Also, for those of you on video, a big shout out to our folks at BetUS who are bringing you this video. So thank them for making it possible. And check out BetUS where you can get 150% deposit bonus up to $2,000 just by using our special code YouTube150. That's YouTube150. I'll put it up on the screen there. Again, that's all you got to do. Start playing today. This exclusive offer, again, 150% sign-up bonus, YouTube 150 from your friends here at Silver and Black today and at BetUS. So check it out. All right, Mo, um, so we, we've talked about what happened, and everybody knows where the Raiders are at. At least most people are, I think, accepting the fact of where this team is at, uh, even though it's just six weeks in. Uh, the plan the rest of the season, what does this team need to do? I talked about right before the break, and I want to get your reaction to this, is I think unless he starts really hurting you, i.e. lots of turnovers and playing really poorly, again, I know you're paying Gardner Minshew money, good money, but I think you just got to roll with Aiden O'Connell because, again, I think I already know what he is, but if you're the Raiders, there's no advantage to starting Gardner Minshew. He is an insurance policy. And uh, it, it, this year, if the Raiders finish like we, we think they will with four or five wins, they'll be in position to either move up and get a quarterback or be right there to get a quarterback of the future. And so he's going to be in your plans. And you just might as well play the young kid and play all young players that you can to see what you have. Are you there with me, too? Is that is that you, what you feel the Raiders will do now, knowing that this road's not going to end up uh, fighting for the Lombardi Trophy in February? It's the logical thing to do now, Scott. I mean, you you allow Aiden O'Connell to play and develop him as his, as a backup quarterback because that's, in my opinion, what he is. And we've always said that he's a backup quarterback. He could be a pretty good backup quarterback. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily going to cost you games with turnovers, but he can keep the offense steady if he's asked to you know step in as a fill-in starter, which is fine. But you let him get that experience, let him play out the season because I think the experience would be good for him. Gardner Minshew is what he is at this point in his career. I know they haven't won a two-year deal, but he is no, he's not obviously not the future. Aiden O'Connell isn't either, but he's still 26 years old. There's still room for development. So I think that's what the Raiders should focus on as far as the quarterback uh, position is, is concerned. And then you just look forward to the 2025 draft and whoever that is, you insert him into that roster onto that roster, and you don't have to rush to start your rookie right away. You can do what the Patriots have done with Drake May, where you allow Aiden O'Connell to start the first, the first four or five weeks of next season. And then when you find a good spot to put in your rookie, you put him out there. Now, of course, if he's ready, like Jaden Daniels and Caleb Williams, you start your rookie right, right away. But I think moving forward, you have to look at Aiden O'Connell as your insurance policy and say, OK, we're going to develop him and see if he can be a high end backup quarterback in this league. Yeah, exactly. And then you have to see what else you have, too. I mean, look, we understand uh, Jackson Powers Johnson, and, and <laughs> it was so funny to talk about a young guy who's a, a good leader. You can tell already he's trying to take responsibility for everything when it wasn't all his fault. He had some penalties. He had some issues there, of course, the one downfield, all that stuff. 
but still he's playing well as did dj glaze i'm not saying these guys play perfect they're young players but mo I, i've been very very impressed with dj glaze if you look at the pressure numbers coming through that side with both those guys uh, and dylan parham went down uh, yesterday, obviously with a foot or Sunday with a foot injury, but um, those guys are playing pretty well. They just need to develop. So it's going to be an up and down situation for them as they learn on the job, but you got to keep them in there. Uh, and and then for what you do with the rest of that offensive line, we see what Colt Miller is. We know what he is. And then on the inside there, depending on what happens with Parham, we'll see who they, they put there, but it's going to be, I think, just making sure that you get as many snaps for those guys up front so that when you go into the off season, you say, okay, you know, now if we, if, if we're good with Colton Miller still, we got three solid up front, Andre James, you know, eh, he's been hit and miss this year, uh, but you, and then you need maybe a right guard if Parham's not the answer long-term. So you look at that though, and you, you feel pretty good about where you're at with that. Right. But, but to me, those guys just need their opportunity to stay in there. If they can stay healthy, of course, and, and develop, that timing develop the experience and just get the number of snaps as much as they can throughout the season i believe there was a stat from pff floating around that uh dj glaze didn't allow any pressures when he was lined up opposite tj watt yeah which is pretty good start for a rookie going up against a, a dpoy player defensive player of the year but if you're looking at that offensive line long term i know a lot of raider fans wanted to get rid of colton miller last offseason because they was they said he's getting too old offensive lineman i mean if you look at trent williams those guys can play into the mid to late 30s yeah uh he had shoulder surgery he's having a rough year we'll see what what the future looks like for him but i do like what i see out of jpj overall talked about dj glaze i think dylan parm is the answer at right guard because he had in my opinion well. before jpj stepped in he was their best offensive lineman yeah I would replace Andre James. I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't on really on board with them re-signing him to a three-year, twenty-four million dollar deal. I've been wanting to move on from Andre James. He's just a little too inconsistent for me. We'll see what they think about it long term. But again, he's on a three-year deal, so I, I would like to see where the guaranteed money is spread on his contract because that will tell you whether it's feasible to move on from him or not uh, in in the next offseason. Does JPJ go to center? Maybe. Eventually, he can. He can. He definitely can because that's where he played at Oregon. I think a lot of people are overlooking the fact that JPJ wasn't a guard in his last collegiate year at Oregon. He was a center. Yeah. So if you want to, if you if you want to move on from Andre James next offseason, you feel like okay, maybe the three year deal was a I don't want to call it a mistake, but a misstep. You can move JPJ over to center and draft another guard. Yeah. I mean, he won an award for being such a good center in college. I forget the name of it now. Uh, it's not. A, yes, there you go. Thank you. Uh, so, so yeah, there's there's things there. When you look at the rest of this offense, Mo, I think this is where there's a lot of flux. Clearly, they need help at running back. I think Alexander Madison. You know, they asked Pierce at the press conference Monday about, hey, you know, Madison comes out, has this great start, and then you go away from him. And we asked him after the game, were you injured? He said, no, I was perfectly fine. And the answer from Coach Pierce was, well, we're trying to keep guys fresh. So so I get that, and, and that is part of the plan. Most teams do that. But um, Alexander Madison is, is a stopgap. He's a guy there. You like having him as a number two, no question, especially with his experience and what he's able to do. But they clearly need to get a running back. They get to, they have to find a young running back next year. They also need to figure out what they're going to do at the wide receiver position. They have Jacoby Myers there, of course. Uh, Trey Turner is there, and he he had a nice thing, but he's not a number one guy anywhere. And so so there's a lot of question marks here too with this offense. Um, when you think about outside the line, which you got to start with that line anyway, right? You you win in the trenches, so they get that first. That's the most important thing, of course. Quarterback. But then the wide receiver situation, you have Brock Bowers. Hopefully you have Michael Mayer. Hopefully he figures out what's going on and comes back and is okay. Um, so you you kind of like that makeup of what you have on the inside. But on the outside with the wide receiver situation and with the running back situation, this is something too where I think they're going to let guys play this year because of injury and obviously uh, if Devontae Adams does get shipped out. But I, there's no long-term answers, I, I, I don't think, on this roster at those positions. But this is why I'm okay with – this is why – not just okay, but this is why I would push to to trade Devontae Adams. I don't care how he feels about Aiden O'Connell, Sheffy, Adam Schefter of ESPN put a report saying that he likes playing with Aiden O'Connell. I still think he's out of the door because there's no way Devontae Adams looks at this team and says, yeah, I want to be part of this for the next two to three months. He's out of the door anyway. 
And I know a lot of fans will say, well, yeah, you ship Devontae Adams out so you can get your quarterback. I think the Rams are going to have a top three, top five pick the way they're playing right now. So they'll be able to draft their quarterback with, with their first pick. And then when you trade Devontae Adams, hopefully for at least a third round pick, because so far yeah. Adam Schefter said the Raiders aren't getting what they want, which is a second rounder. If they can somehow get a third rounder, now you're thinking about in the second and third round, you draft your skilled players. You get another yes. wide receiver to replace Devontae Adams. You get another running back to be your number one running back. Alexander Madison is on an expiring contract. He's only on a one-year deal. Samir White right now isn't the answer. So you draft your quarterback in the first round. You draft your running back wide receiver in the second and third rounds to address the skill positions because your quarterback is going to need some playmakers around him along with that offensive line. Yeah, no question. And and, and your point about the Devontae Adams trade too is, yeah, at best a third. I mean, that, that same Schefter interview I think you're talking about too, he talked about, look, a lot of teams are looking at it and saying, they're going to cut him after the year anyway because this is the last year of his guaranteed deal. So the, the Raiders can cut him and walk away after the season and then you don't have to give up anything but the money, right? So so the Raiders, again, are in a, it reminds me, again, of the Darren Waller situation, of the Derek Carr situation. I know it was a different regime, but the, the Raiders could have traded Devontae Adams for a second-round pick during the offseason, and they did not do it. So I'll leave that there. I'm not going to go on a rant about whether it was right, wrong, or indifferent, because we talked about not trading him. You and I did. We didn't think it, if you really thought you had a chance this year, you don't do it because he's your best offensive player. Uh, but looking back at it now and how things have unfolded, whew, it's certainly uh, they, they're not going to get the value they would have gotten, let's say, in May or June had they traded him then. No, that that ship has definitely sailed. And we and I think I talked about it with one of our callers that at best I said the Raiders are going to get the second round pick. And that's from a desperate team. We'll see if the price goes up or teams get a little bit more desperate as the trade deadline approaches. But as of right now. You know, the word out is that they Schefter put out the Jets proposal. It was, I believe it was two third rounders. Two third rounders, yeah, yeah. Uh in consecutive years. So if that's the best that they can do, they may have to settle for that. I still think he if you're looking at the destinations, he probably goes to the Jets regardless, because the Saints right now have a question. The quarterback with Derek Carr is struggling with an oblique injury. I think Devontae Adams is gonna want to go to a team that has the best shot of making the playoffs. And if you're looking at the Jets, the Saints the Jets have the better pathway to the AFC playoffs. Absolutely, especially with that defense. All right, we're going to take our final break. When we come back, guess what? It's time to go out. I'm sure, you know, phone again. When we have games like this, the phone starts ringing right after the game ends. And I see the messages pouring in, so we're going to get to those. We have a lot of longtime listener callers that called in, so a lot of the names you're familiar with, uh, maybe a, a new one here and there. But we're going to get to those calls because we want to hear what you guys have to say. We sit here and talk to you. You might agree with us sometimes, disagree with us sometimes, totally fine. But we want to hear what you have to say on the Raider Nation mailbag. So we're going to get to that next here on Silver and Black Today and Odyssey Sports. Original podcast brought to you by, on video, our good friends at BetUS. Don't go anywhere. Scott and Mo, we're coming right back after these words. Enough of hearing us talk about the Raiders. It's time to hear from, from you. Any Oakland Raider fan, Las Vegas Raider fan, stand up. On this edition of the Raider Nation Mailbag. Yeah, that, that black hole rock and rolling. Rock and rolling. Don't be a wallflower. Be a part of the show. Leave your question or message by calling 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869. Or drop us an email at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. All right, that's it. We're back. We are talking with you now. We're going to get the voice of the fan here. I'm sure everybody's going to be happy, bubbly, right, Mo? Bubbly? <laughs> happy oh, with, yeah. With Cheery. Direction. All unicorns and rainbows. Yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, on the post-game show, too, I think people weren't expecting Murph to be so, uh, uh, I think... Yeah. Um, Dower, not Dower, Dower is the wrong word, uh, to be so frank about some of what he feels is wrong. Uh, and his disappointment, for example, in a lot of, and I think a lot of fans follow him there too, and we'll see if our callers agree, in this idea that they were sold on, which you and I, to be fair, and I'm not just trying to say, ah, see, I told you so, but we are going to tell you. And that is, we said, hey, look, slogans are great. Image is great. Attitude is great. You love that. That's part of it. But the substance is what matters, right? The resume on the grass stuff, all that. Um, and when you take it literally, two and four is not the resume people were expecting. So we'll see how it all runs out. But we're going to get to those calls now. So we'll jump right in. 
We're going to go. We're going to stay because, you know, Mo's in New York. So we want to stay in New York. We'll start with the, with the East Coast rep here. And that is our good friend Dave Casper, the ghost, up in uh, New York State. Well, hello, guys. This is Dave Casper, the ghost from the great state of New York, the night after or the morning after another debacle. Um, I'm not going to go over everything that you guys have pointed out, Mo. I listen to your, I watch your thing post game, and and I listen to Scott your your uh, pod the, the podcast last night with Murph, Morph last night. Um, but basically, in a nutshell, uh, this team is heading in the wrong direction. Clearly, they're regressing. Everything that AP preached about in the off season is fall has fallen on hollow or all hollow. Empty, empty words. Um, they're an embarrassment. They're an embarrassing organization, and it just goes in circles for the last 20-plus years. Different coaches, different players, it's always the same result. Um, I, like I told you guys the very first time I called you, I was not a fan of the AP hire. Now, clearly you can't fire him in, the, in mid-season. I guess you could, but they're going to ride it with him. Uh, but immediately they need to uh, take the play calling away from Luke Getze. The Jets <laughs> just did it with Hackett, so it's, it, it can be done. He's a terrible play caller. He, uh, needs to be stripped of those duties immediately. Not that it would make a difference. But the fact that uh, I can, t- I, I, I can understand the team has a lot of injuries and I don't think they're as talented as some other uh, fans and people thought they were. I thought they were a seven-win team. Clearly, they're more of a four-five-win team. I cannot tolerate a team not being competitive. You can be undermanned. You can be lack of talent. But show me that you're competitive. Three of the last four weeks, they have been blown out. The one time, in the one game, they barely beat a bad Cleveland team. They are going in the wrong direction, for fast. Um, AP, the comps are Dan Campbell. I, I compare him more to Singletary. Mm. Which, uh, and, and if you really want to say it, he's Joe Bugle part two. <laughs> he is not cut out for this job. Can he learn to, to take, uh, one specific case in point? When Abdullah scored the touchdown, they went to no huddle instead of challenging that call. It wouldn't have made a difference. It would, but it would have cut it to a one score game and you never know. So, Another in-game decision that I think was terrible. Um, where do we go from here? I don't know. So if I, I'm going to end it on a question for both you guys. If you were both GMs, put your GM caps on. If the Raiders stay on, on this progression and they finish the season 4-13, and 5-12, and 12, are you removing AP from the job? Because mm-hmm. I am. I would. Um, and uh, welcome to mock draft season, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dave Casper, Casper the Ghost in New York State, uh, thanks for your call. Bo, he had a whopper of a question there for us at the end. We both said just a little earlier that we were not sitting here telling you that they should fire Antonio Pierce right now, but you brought up something, and I agree with your point of view on this, and I'll let you expand on it a little bit, which is if if they get just, again, uh, mollywopped, since it's the, 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 the word of the day, if they get mollywopped in these games the rest of the way and they finish four and 13 or five and 12, uh, then the chances of that happening, I think, would be pretty great. If they finish with that record, but they improve, they're close in games because the schedule gets difficult down the line. We know this. There's a couple spots, but overall, it's going to get harder. Uh, and, and they show some fight. And so then I think it's less of a chance. Are you, are you in the same spot I am? So I answered Dave Casper with the ghost question. It all depends on how the Raiders are losing. If the Raiders are four and thirteen, but they're a competitive four and thirteen, I sit Antonio Pierce down and say something on offense has to change. Either you let go of Luke Getzey, or I have to let go of you and all the coaching staff. And then Antonio Pierce, the ball's in his court, what he does from there. But if they're getting blown out, if their average margin of loss is in the double digits, then I have to clean house. And that the key, the key stat here is point differential. That means mm. how many points you're scoring versus how many points your opponent's scoring. So if the Raiders have one of the worst point differentials at the end of the year and they're getting blown out in most of their games, I got to clean house because they're re- clearly regressing. Just look within the division, Scott. They still have to play the Chiefs twice. The Chargers are getting better every week. The Denver Broncos, I know they lost to the Chargers, but they're getting better. They've won some surprising games. 
Every other team in the division is improving and you're heading in the opposite direction. As a GM, you have to look at that and say, well, I understand what you did last year when I wasn't here and I commend you for that great job. But since you've taken over as a full-time head coach, Antonio Pierce, your offense has gotten worse. The team is not disciplined. You're already calling out players for business decisions two weeks into the season, three weeks into the season. Guys aren't guys aren't giving max effort. We're watching it on film. Something has to change, and it has to be you if you're not going to make changes on your coaching staff. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You, you have to be able to do it. The problem is, real quickly, because you talk about other people on the – I mean, again, this coaching staff is massive, but you look at the offensive staff under Luke Getze, and you got a lot of retreads and guys I wouldn't want call – play calling either Joe Philbin Rich Scangarello which you've talked about many times past that what Scott Turner he's the pass game coordinator uh you know I mean Carnell Williams he's running backs I mean there, there's just nobody there Mo that I could see elevating and that's where people are like fire Getsy today okay if you fire him you have to replace him and people are well somebody will do a better job I don't know that that's true I think Scott Turner could do an okay job, but is he a young, brilliant mind like 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 I talked about with Ben Johnson in Detroit when when the Lions upgrade got rid of Anthony Lynn and upgraded Ben Johnson? The Raiders don't have a Ben Johnson on that staff, right? So this is why I say that something has to. I sit Antonio Pierce down and say either you change something or you got to go. Yeah, yeah, and I mean Scott Turner again. Uh, he obviously is a UNLV guy, by the way. But if you look at that, he's been around a lot. You're talking 12 years in the NFL, and he's just not on that 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 track. He's been quarterbacks coach, wide receiver coach, quality control on offense. He's had those positions. Those are not nothing against Scott Turner. I'm sure he's a great guy, but those are not the guys on the track to become like a Johnson and those guys who are going to be offensive coordinator and then step into a head coaching position next. He's just not on that trajectory. So I don't see it there, but I understand everybody's frustration because it is terrible to watch. All right. We're going out to our good friend Raider Loke in the 626, if I recall. What is up? Scott and Mo and the rest of Raider Nation that's tuning in. This is Raider Loke from the 626. Well, AOC just threw that pick. Uh, did uh, Justin Fields just scored? And let's just say the game's <laughs> over with it not even being over with, uh, let's just say, the game just turned on with eight minutes left. Um, and uh, I remember hearing in the podcast that uh, I remember Bo mentioned it, that uh, Mark Davis does not like to get embarrassed. Um, I believe a lot of the firings have came after embarrassing performance. Uh, let's just say that this is an embarrassing performance. Uh, we keep getting blown out. Um, I don't understand why. I mean, these games should be competitive, in my opinion. I get it where you have offensive uh, playmakers missing, like Devontae Adams and Jacoby Myers and a few other entries. I get it. But we should be competitive at least. But we haven't been in these losses, um, obviously against the Panthers, obviously against the Broncos, and then now against the Steelers. It's just uh, not sure uh, but uh, what's going on. Uh, but uh, the offensive continues to sputter and look just, you know, you know, um, shit. Uh, pardon my language, but at the end of the day, um, I believe there's a personal meeting going to happen between AP and Mark Davis. There's going to be probably somebody that's going to get can get the uh overhead projector treatment uh but um yeah i mean today uh, mark davis doesn't like to get embarrassed i get it but at the end of the day i believe this is just a lost season with this performance i know that there was some leagues of montanos and i get traded with this performance he may want out now so uh, i think this is just a lost season we got aoc and i get it we got injuries but we should look competitive and if the, at the end we don't even look we keep, keep getting blown out you know second home game and um yeah so that's my thoughts on this game, even though it's not over, but I'm um, pretty much over. Just Raider Loke. <laughs> Raider Loke with a great call, as as usual. And amazing how a lot of what people think, and this is why I love our, our listeners, not just because they agree with us a lot, but but he he basically is saying what we were saying earlier in the show, right? Which is, this is what it is, and he's laid it out there. It's it's great. Listen, I know it. How, you could hear the frustration in his voice because he called us before the game was even over. I think that might be a first, actually. But, you know, that tells you where he's at, but he also recognizes what the problems are and and how to maybe go about fixing them, at least to start and, and having Mark Davis make decisions. But good call there, man. Great call there. And and, and it, I'm going to harp on this because I'm, I am I want Raider fans to hear me on this because mm -hmm. I know Raider, a lot of Raider fans love them some Antonio Pierce. And I understand that based on what he did last year, turning that team around and what he brings to the to the culture and organization, 
I get all of that. But Mark Davis has some impulse in him, and Randall oh, Book yeah. brought it up. You know, it. You know, these losses, these double digit losses, continue to pile up. Not a good sign for Antonio Pierce. He, he may even survive the season, but he won't be brought back in 2025 with that type of resume if it keeps going in the opposite direction, especially if players are starting to check out. I think the, the, the final the final nail in the coffin, so to speak, would be if he has to continue to call players out for making business decisions or if we're just seeing a lot of half effort on the field, if he has to start releasing players because they're not giving full effort on the field, then you start to say, okay, maybe he has lost the pulse of the locker room where players are just not responding to his coaching tactics and techniques. Because if that becomes an issue, then you're going to have to clean house. Right, and it's not enough. I mean, after the game on Sunday, he said, look, we, we're not coaching good enough. We're not playing good enough. We're not focusing good enough. All true and and, and good for him for, for, for recognizing it and acknowledging it. But you can't say that every week. <laughs> Like if it continues that way, then you got to look and say, well, okay, then you're not able to do it. And if you're not able to do it, then you move on. So we'll see. But Raider Loke, great call. Appreciate it. Uh, Now we're going back up to Portland. Our good buddy PNW Orlando calling us from the great state of Oregon. Hey, Mo and Scott. Well, it's the fourth quarter and I'm already calling Oh, PNW Orlando here in uh, Portland, Oregon. Not on fire. And actually it's a beautiful day out here. Just beautiful. Anyway. Uh, so like I said, calling in the fourth, so game's not even over. Uh, officially looking into mock season at this point. So <laughs> yeah, um, I'm still a Cam Ward kind of guy. Uh, I will say this, Shadour's grown on me a little bit, but <laughs> I digress. Um, I guess the burning questions for this week are, uh, what are you looking for for this team in the next couple weeks? Um, believe it or not, they could win a couple more games. I don't think they will but they could uh, you know schedule to schedule uh and uh if they don't i think this might be the end of ap but we'll see all right well start looking at my mock drafts and uh hope you guys are well <laughs> thanks for all you do go hey, team at, at least he didn't sound like he wanted to jump off a building right so uh, yeah. i mean he's just, we're just like, ah, okay not happy about it, but uh, what do we need to see? I mean, Mo, for me, again, it goes back to what I've been saying for the last four weeks. I just want to see progress. Like for me, if you can see progress in all aspects of the game uh, and that that there's increased focus, the penalties go down, uh, even though there are penalties, again, people were like uh, complaining about the penalties. Raiders were 23rd or 24th entering the game in penalties. So they're still overall, they have costly penalties, but the number is not huge it's just they come at terrible times so i see that but i want to see that i want to see the focus the discipline and just the hustle the effort again i i'm not saying i see guys quit because i don't think that's happened but i do see like you said i, I you know 70 80 percent on tackles sometimes and is that why they're missing tackles i want to see those fundamentals i think that's what you need to see and frankly the players if they want to stay in las vegas and they want to be raiders maybe now they all don't want to be but uh, I'm sure a lot of them do. If you want to be, you got to show it over these next uh, uh, 13 weeks. And I, I just want to start out with this because you talked about the poor tackling and, and not quitting but not giving maximum effort. Mm-hmm. Having played a little bit of sports on a, on a low, low level, in most sports, defense, a lot of defense is energy. Yes. It's energy and want to. If you lack energy, you're not going to be a good defender football, basketball, any type of most sports. If you're on a defensive side, you need to come with energy and want to. If you lack those things, you're not going to be good defensively. Now, as far as we, we want to see for the rest of the season, even though this season is basically in a toilet bowl right now, I said it in the first segment, you're looking at player development. So we talk about a lot of the Raiders' issues in the offseason with drafting, right? So we have Tom Telesco's first draft class in place. Brock Bowers playing pretty well on offense. DJ Glaze, is the third rounder. As I said, zero pressures allowed when going up against TJ Watt. Jackson Powers Johnson overall playing pretty well. So these are some of the players that we're going to be looking at for the remainder of the season to be part of the fabric of this Raiders team going forward. The rebuild or the retooling, whatever you want to call it. These players are going to have to be key starters 
moving forward. So you hope that you see a lot of development, you see progress out of these guys, or anyone else that's on the field for the remainder of the year. Tyree Wilson, even, I'll bring up that name. Now that Malcolm Koontz is out for the season, Christian Wilkins is out, so maybe you have you call up a defensive tackle who can get some development. We saw Malcolm Butler, unfortunately, have a, have a make a play where he committed a penalty at an inopportune time that negated uh, a good one. So I'm just looking at the young players, the, yeah. the, the rookies, the second-year guys, the third-year guys. How well do they play for the remainder of the season knowing that they're probably not going to make the playoffs? Yeah, and and again, I think too that when you when you you brought up such a great point about energy and 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 swarming around the ball, it it, it sometimes is a difference between a good defense being great and an average defense being good, right? So I look at it because I remember a lot of folks we were talking about, and I even I looked at it on paper, uh, even though they had some good players up front. You looked at the Chargers defense in the own in their own division, and you said, nah, eh, nah, eh, okay. The Chargers are fourth in the in the league right now in defense. The Raiders are what 16th or 17th. So, and again, to me, that goes back to the coaching, right? They get a good coach coming over, and he's getting everything he can out of those guys. I'm not saying man for man, they're better or worse than the Raiders, because I don't know them well enough to know that. I just know that I see that often, to your point, Mo. I see that. With the right coaching, you can get a lot out. We saw it last year with Robert Spillane on the Raiders. Here's a guy who came over from Pittsburgh. They were like, yeah, we're not going to sign you. And and Antonio Pierce and the defense, Patrick Graham, got more out of him than they did in Pittsburgh. I mean, he just came on fire. He was he was there, and, and that all happened. So, so I agree with you, and I think that that's what we got to see out of this team the rest of the way is just who wants it. If you want it, you'll show it. If you don't, well, then you'll be moving on. Pretty simple, straightforward. Okay. Uh, we're going to go out now to California, uh, staying on the West Coast, Misha in Orange County. Hey, what's up, guys? It's Misha calling live from Orange County after another <laughs> abysmal performance. Um, my good friend Mo Moten loves to talk about consistency. Mm. I love to talk about how much I dislike Luke Etsy. <laughs> and once again, you know, no aggressiveness. All kind of boring stuff, same kind of plays we've seen, checkdowns, no aggressiveness, no shots downfield. I don't think I saw a wide receiver touch the ball until the end of the third quarter. Um, and just more bonehead plays that were, you know, behind the line of scrimmage. I think both the fumbles um, happened with plays that were, you know, starting behind the line of scrimmage. Um, especially the, the second one, I think Abdullah with the fumble, I mean, yeah, we're at like the, the one yard line and he ran a shotgun formation handoff and I just don't get it. I mean, that, it just makes absolutely no sense to me. Um, you know, more penalties, turnovers, you know, it's just, it's like endless. And, you know, I think, uh. I'm packing it in, folks. <laughs> I'm thinking ahead to next year um, because the reality is we don't have an offensive line. We don't have a run game. We don't have any receivers currently. Uh, we don't have a quarterback. And we have one of the most atrocious play callers in the history of the league. So I don't see how um, we're going to have any success with that. So... Let's start talking about next season. Much love, guys. Talk to you soon. All right. There you go, Misha. He's guy, he's Misha. done. He's done. But I will tell you this, at least, and, and I know that, that Murph always talks about being relieved of expectations. Um, and I think that's where, you know, and, until they show you something to be excited about, that's where I would be is just watch some of these guys develop, see how they develop. The players, you know, will be around next year and how it goes and the flow. Uh, and, and that's it. I mean, I'm not, again, I don't want people to be depressed and not want to watch Raider games the rest of the year. But at the same time, I would certainly understand it. This is the part of the season where I call who wants to be here part of the season where mm. you know you're not going to make the playoffs, but you're maybe on an expiring contract or your roster position isn't secure. How bad do you want to be a Raider? Because now you have the Raiders are two and four. <laughs> you have, what, 11 more games left in the season. 
you're playing not just for pride and the name on the back of your jersey. You're playing for a job elsewhere or with the team yeah. because you still have to put good, you know, good, good plays on film because you still have a career to play for. So that's what the players are playing for. And as a fan, you're looking at this and saying, well, who's the keeper and who's the goner? And you're like, okay, this young guy can help us next year and going forward with a rebuild. This guy can't help us. Let him go or let his contract is probably let him be a fridge and go somewhere else. And I think that's how a lot of people are unfortunately looking at Jack Jones right now. After Jack Jones last year, you're thinking, oh, he's a CB1. I said it yeah. on this show. He's great. Yes. He's a CB1. He's a starter. He's he's cheap on his deal. He's definitely a keeper. Jack Jones, now I'm looking at it like, Maybe he's not a keeper. Maybe he's out of there next year, especially if, if AP is not there. Jack, I don't think Jack Jones has a shot because he right. he's the reason. The reason Jack Jones is on the Raiders roster right now is because of AP. And when he took over for Josh McDaniels, he said, hey, if this guy doesn't work. I can get rid of both of us. And it worked out last year. Not looking so hot this year. But what I will say, I want to think, Scott, about me sharing this call and the play calling situation Luke Getze, right? I'm not Kyle Shanahan or Sean McVay. But even I could see that running the ball on first and 20, Running the football on first and 20 multiple times when you're like first or second and long, it's not a good idea. No. You want to talk about conservative? I think Ted Winnie of the Athletic called it cowardly. Cowardly. I don't know yes, what to call it, but running the ball on first and 20 when you're down and you got nothing going for your offense, you have no. nothing much to lose. You're running the ball on first and 20. Except, no for, game. except for Brock Bowers, which they were going to early. But again, once you have no other threats, of course, they're going to double team him and the opportunities are going to go down. But I'd still rather try to get him the ball than run on first and 20. Right. <laughs> I mean, and yes, not having Michael Mayer there hurts because I think you would have a really good viable second option to pass out of that personnel set. But to me, it's it's agreed. It, it, I, I don't even I don't even like to talk about it because there's nothing to talk about. It's so bad, right? There's just and and it's easy to blame an offensive coordinator when offense isn't going well. But in this case, even the casual football fan can see that it's just insanity. So we'll see what happens. But Misha, thank you for the call. Now we're going back out to the East Coast, North Carolina. This is Tommy. Oh, what's up, fellas? This is Tommy from North Carolina. Did you hear the most eye? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was nothing good about it. Uh, when it was 22 to seven, you felt pretty good. You got a touchdown, 22 to 13. Uh, that penalty was costly. And I, I feel like that was a definitive, uh, moment in the game where it kind of took the wind, uh, the wind out of your sails. Um, I hate to say it, but I think this offense just is what it is. Uh, you had no Devontae Adams, no Jacoby Myers. I mean, Zemir White's hurt, but that doesn't really do much for you. I just think it is what it is. I really don't think it matters who's under center. I don't know if it matters what weapons you have. The the Raiders' offense is just inept and allergic to really doing anything impactful. Um, it is what it is. Um, mm -hmm. If you guys got any positives and you guys can instill any positivity <laughs> in me, that would be absolutely wonderful. Cause I just think this Raiders season just is what it is, and I think it's – I'm not going to say it's over, but I think it's over quicker than we – Maybe would have liked to anticipate. Uh, you guys are the best. You guys keep it real. Hope you guys have a good week. And go Raiders. There you go. Tommy from the Tar Heel State. Thanks, man. We appreciate the kind words as always. Hey, man, from a positive perspective, Mo, look, Brock Bowers, anybody who had doubts about him, holy crap. So just, just watch Brock Bowers because I, I believe, I believe when it's all said and done, and I don't mind going on this limb, Brock Bowers is going to be one of the greatest quote unquote tight ends. And he, we know he's much more than that uh, to play the game. I really believe that. I think that if he stays healthy and he can stay healthy, that um, his skill set, what he was doing, they, they actually, I got to give Luke Getzey credit here. They did line him up. Remember going back to the summer, Mo, when I said you got to have that H back set mm -hmm. like they did at Georgia. He, mm -hmm. when he was coming out of that H back set, it worked brilliantly for the Raiders. Of course, then when they couldn't do anything else, right, you, it gets shut down. But nonetheless, that, that's the one positive I would tell you, Tommy. One of the positives I'd take from this year is you got one of the best there. Imagine when the Raiders do get a dynamic, uh, uh, functionally mobile quarterback. Boy, there's going to be a lot of yards between those two guys. Now you talked about Brock Bowers, right? And you say he could be, you know, one of the best tight ends, and I and I totally agree with that sentiment. 
I, what I do hope though is that he doesn't have the Tony Gonzalez route where he has very little playoff experience because the teams he played on <laughs> weren't very good. And we're so, starting to say positive, Mo. And, and so that the national state, the national media doesn't really get to embrace Brock Browse as much as they should because they don't see him in these prime time games and playoff yeah. games. I hope that's not his future. Let's hope it's not because the Rays will get a quarterback. But that's the that's the positive to take away from this. And I think I said this in the offseason. I said, while I do have major issues and question marks about Luke Getze, the one thing he can do is get the ball to his tight end and develop tight ends because he did it in Green Bay as a pass game coordinator. He did it in Chicago with Cole Komet, and I felt like he was going to do it in Las Vegas with Michael Mayer and Brock Bowers. Now, Michael Mayer, unfortunately, away from the team with personal matters. Hope he gets well, whatever's going on there. But Luke Getze is, to me, he just needs to be a tight end coach. <laughs> just be a tight end coach because that's what that's he does well. And, I, and I, other than that, as I said, the decisions he makes, the shotgun formation when you need to get one yard, running the ball on first and 20, and then again on second and 18, I just throw it all away as far as the play calling situation is concerned. Yeah. But the other positive I want, I want to just look at it, you know, from a macro perspective and I'll go back to this with Tom Telesco, because I know a lot of people are giving Tom Telesco heat for not trading Devontae Adams. Again, if you look at Tom Telesco's first draft class, it's shaping up pretty well. I'll go through it again. Rock Bowers, JPJ, DJ Glaze looks pretty solid. So if, if this is the future of your draft record going forward, which starters at the top, this team can turn it around because what, what's the, what's been one of the major problems with this Raider team organization regimes? They've drafted poorly, especially early. They pissed away how many first round picks under the Gruden regime, right? So if Tom Tesco can draft a lot better, this thing can get turned around. Absolutely. So there you go, Tommy. There's some positive for you, man. Appreciate uh, you listening, and thank you again for calling. We'll hear from you again, I'm sure. All right, now we. Way. What's that? Go ahead. Really quick. Yeah. By the way, uh, uh, during Tommy's call, I will say I heard about five or six Mo size. <laughs> Either he was he out of breath or he was giving five or six Mo size during that whole call. But shout out to Tommy for that one. <laughs> we got to get people uh, at Allegiant Stadium to have a bunch of Mo size signs. <laughs> Every time the Raiders have like a turnover or something, they just hold up. <laughs> just, uh, Mo, Mo size. <laughs> Somebody make it happen out there. I know you Somebody will. Somebody please make it happen. That would be please. amazing. We might have that to get Kelly awesome. Kreiner to do it, but uh, that's all good. All right. Now we're going out to our buddy Tarek. Of course, Tarek is, is a man of many highs and many lows when he calls in. <laughs> I think he's probably in the middle on this one, though, because he's already moved to acceptance. So let's see what Tarek has to say. Good evening, Scott and Mo. This is Tarek calling you guys from Moline right here in Illinois. Moline! I just, uh, finished watching the most uh, dreadful performance possibly of the season with the Raiders getting embarrassed at home to the Steelers. Um, again, just ridiculous, pathetic. Um, Antonio Pierce, you talked about making business decisions. You're looking like a real idiot right now. Um, he deserved this coaching, coaching gig? Absolutely, but... I think he is kind of coming apart at the seams. I'm not sure he knows what he's doing anymore. And, again, to continue to retain and keep uh, Getsy with this atrocious play calling. I understand we had some players out, but the, the play calling was dreadful uh, for 60 minutes, maybe minus the opening drive. Can't Still can't run the football. The defense is depleted. Uh, so much for Jack Jones. I thought he was going to turn the corner and be like a, a shutdown corner for us. Um Tom Brady, all this talk about Tom Brady, let me try to contain my excitement. Who cares? Speaking of who cares, I don't think Mark Davis cares. He's the biggest clown and the biggest bum Ooh. of an owner in the in the entire league. The guy's an absolute joke. Uh, I wish fans would make the decision to boycott the rest of the season. I mean, who honestly is going to pay their hard-earned money for this product? He has the audacity to have the most expensive tickets in the NFL. What an absolute joke. We lead the league in turnovers. And, uh, I mean, there's really not a whole lot that Raider fans can say that we haven't already said, but you could start by getting rid of Getsy. I've said it on a previous call. If he's on, if he's still on the coaching staff 24 hours from now, then shame on you, Antonio Pierce. And if you retain Getsy, then, then maybe you don't deserve to go into next year. Maybe you deserve to be fired after this year because this is all on your watch as the head coach. Uh, can't wait to hear your guys' uh, shows this week. Have a great week and I'll talk to you guys again soon. Bye bye. All right, we've had really excited and really depressed Tarek. Now we have gangster Tarek. He's just no, we 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 got he's cutting people, man. He's cutting we got, people. We got Tarek throwing heat. He yes, he called we we got we got idiot out of Tarek. We got clown out of Tarek. I love I you know what this version of Tarek. I love this version I of Tarek because you know why fired up because this this is 
this is the fan emotion coming out. And I, and I love to hear it because, as he said, you can be angry about, you know, the product the team is putting on the field. But as long as you keep paying a, and supporting them, why should Mark Davis care? Because the checks are still rolling in. Why should he? Why should he want to change the product other than he wants the Raiders to win football games? Yeah. But, it, but but it's still rolling in money, it's still lining his pockets. If the people are still coming out, whether they're the home for the home team or the away team, he's fine. You know, as far as that, because it, apparently he's made bad decisions, right, with the coaching staff and the front office and who the people he's hired. But it doesn't seem like he. I don't want to say he doesn't care because I think he cares. But I just don't see the urgency. Remember when there was a fan yelling at Mark Davis to fire Josh McDaniels and he was like smarting up? And that's when the whole smarten up phrase came up. Yeah. Yeah. And what did he do weeks after that? He fired Josh McDaniels. Why is it that the fans who are emotionally invested, as Tarek was on that call, how is it that they can see what's best for the team before Mark Davis? I don't think it's a lack of caring. I just think it's a lack of foresight and football mm. knowledge, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah, and you know, I made the comparison to somebody uh, earlier today, and I know you guys are going to be like, what? They couldn't be more different, um, not only in personal value, wealth, but also people. But uh, Jerry Jones, I mean, to me, Jerry Jones is a bigger joke of an owner because he's got more of everything, but he's also the GM. He's like an owner that stepped in and is doing all this stuff. And Jerry Jones cares. He wants to win. You know, he's getting up there in age, too. But I think it's there's so much emotional emotional decision making happening, and when you make emotional decision making, you're not re you look at all the the teams that are really really good, the Eagles uh, that have been good for a long time, the Patriots, those owners they love being the owner, they love their own um, uh, celebrity, but they let the football people just kind of do the football stuff and they stay out of it, right? So. For example, they don't hire a head coach before they hire the GM, that kind of thing. That's what I'm talking about, right? And so, yes, and I, I just think that, like, when people, oh, Mark, Dave doesn't care, I understand why you feel that way, and I'm not necessarily telling you I wouldn't feel different if I was a fan because you're just angry and you're not happy with how things have gone for 25 years. But if you look at it, I don't think it's in, that he doesn't care. I think that he sometimes cares too much, and he gets emotionally involved in it, and going back to the quote that Al Davis said about Mark Davis back in the day about, is he going to take over the team one day? He said, well, he's too close to the players, that kind of thing, something to that effect. Uh, somebody will correct me out there and give me the right quote. But that sort of stuff, I think you see. You see a lot of teams where owners are more involved and they get too emotionally involved. And I'm not going to compare Mark Davis to the Washington Commanders and their former ownership because that was a whole mess of other things. But it was another example of a guy too involved making decisions on all kinds of weird stuff and doesn't know football and getting too involved in things he shouldn't. And guess what happens? They get rid of them. They get new ownership and look, commanders are already starting to turn it around. I don't know what's going to happen the rest of the year, but they look pretty good so far this year and the organization's culture has changed. So there's a lot of that and it's worthy of discussion. Um, I just don't know. I mean, I, I think Mark Davis has evolved, but I think, you know, to me, the, the Antonio Pierce decision was a very emotional decision. And I don't necessarily think that that was a decision made with a lot of forethought, as you said. A quick note on this, Scott. If yeah. the Raiders do fire Antonio Pierce and start fresh next year, and I said this on Twitter, Mark Davis needs to remove himself from the hiring process. I said this last at, year, at, remember? At, at, at this point, you, the Raider, fan, Raider fans, you should not want Mark Davis making any hiring decisions. Nothing, any nothing. Dis, no, it's just... Remove yourself from the process, put a football mind in there, have a football of operations, whatever you want to title it, and let that person make the football decisions. Mark Davis, you just supply the money, you root for your team, you can sit in the skybox, whatever you want to do, yeah. but let the football people make football decisions because you <laughs> – you yeah. have made too many poor decisions and put this team in the situation they're in right now. Yeah, and somebody, I think Murph said on the show Sunday, because I brought that up too, because I wrote that piece in January about hiring a president of football operations and just letting them run it. And they answer to Mark Davis and, and they do all the hiring, all that kind of stuff. And he had mentioned that during the Reggie McKenzie era, he kind of, Mark Davis did sort of turn everything over to Reggie. Uh, but again, I, I, I think that it has to be a clean cut of, okay. Yeah. And, and Steinbrenner did this later with the Yankees uh, in his life. When they started to get good again, he kind of, he was way too involved. And then he kind of pulled back and let guys do their job. And it worked out, right? Because then the Yankees uh, got good again. And so I agree with you. I think that's that's what they need to do. But we'll see. 
Who knows? We're just a bunch of guys talking in a microphone. So we'll see what happens. But uh, thanks for the call, Tarek. All right, now we're going to Tarek's good friend and rival, sort of, at least they t they joke about it. And that is our good friend, Yandog. Yes, uh, Scott, Mo. This is uh, Yandog. Uh, I really don't have any answers for this uh, <laughs> Taylor's game. I mean, to me, it's just pathetic and I hate to say this, but uh, and this is the first time I'm probably going to talk about the Raiders like this. I think that the number one college team, the Texas Longhorns, could beat the Raiders the way they're playing. I know their injuries are there, but everybody has injuries. And, uh, you know, it's uh, just pretty sad that, uh, you know, we can't score points. I mean, we were down at the, at the goal line and fumbled the ball. And just like whatever happens, it's just like it's, contagious and uh i have a feeling that this is going to be a long season but we can't make excuses for injuries because a lot of the teams in the nfl have injuries and uh you know they're still uh doing what they got to do but uh it's pretty sad and not really much to talk about when you're only scoring uh you know 13 7 to 13 points a game and that's not Raider football. Raiders, uh, over always, all the years that I've known, offensive powerhouse to put the points up, play the defense, and, uh, I don't know, man. I'm not really too much on this, uh, Mark Davis, uh, <laughs> uh can't compare it to what the father was, Al Davis. It's just like, it just need to be a lot of changes, and, uh, just pretty sad. So, there's not really much to talk about. Uh, Mo and Scott, uh, I wish I could have been a happy Raider fan today. I thought maybe if they could get back on track. And at 2-4, and four, it's not looking good. I mean, I know there's still 11 games left in the season, and uh, we got to do something, though. We really do, or this is just going to be shot. And like I said, for Raider Nation, the best fans in the uh, NFL, it's not cutting it, you know. So, but anyway, thanks for your time, guys. And uh, like I say, you guys always do a good job. I like listening to you, and I uh, just wish it was under better circumstances. And uh, that's about it, guys. Well, you guys have a good day, uh, good evening, and uh, I don't know what to say, but we just got to hang in there and keep our heads up. So and that's about it. Okay, well, thank you very much, and uh, we'll talk soon, and God bless. Bye bye. All right, there you go, Yandog in the Hudson Valley, right? Hudson Valley, mm -hmm. and um, somebody in the Hudson Valley, find Yandog, give him a hug. He needs a hug. <laughs> he give, a hug. give a, if you see a Raider fan out there, give that Raider fan a hug because I, I said this during my Bleach Report live that I, I want to just give a shout out to Raider fans for hanging in there and listening oh, yeah. to listening to us on this show and listening to me on the Bleach Report lives because. It's hard for us to turn on a microphone, turn on our, you know, our devices and talk to and talk to you all and make sense of what's going on when it happens year after year after year, week after week after week after week. So I can imagine being a fan and being emotionally invested in this yeah. and watching this for three hours, 60 minutes or or just turn the game off at the halftime because, you know, what's coming. Dan called before the game was over. I think Misha or one of the other callers who phoned us today also called before the game's over because they knew what was going to happen. They knew the Raiders were going to get their doors blown off. They knew the Raiders weren't going to turn it around. Yandog sounds sad. Tarek is 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 out of his mind. He's angry. He's on fire. Guns blazing. He's on fire. He he's he's you know heated. So I, I just want to commend Raider fans for hanging in there and 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 at least trying to see the positive or asking us, hey, where are the positives here? And we pointed out the rookie class coming in and, and looking ahead to the draft because that's where the Raiders are headed to a top five pick. And you're probably going to eventually be able to get your quarterback. So if you look at Tom Telesco when he was with the Chargers, right, after the Phillip Rivers era was over, Tom Telesco was then in a position to pick, I think it was fifth or sixth, because I think the Dolphins had two, uh, got two and they got uh, Justin Herbert. So Tom Telesco is going to be in a similar situation, in my opinion, with the Raiders in the offseason in 2025, where he's going to have a top five, six pick, and he's going to have his pick of quarterbacks. Now, you're just hoping, as he did with the Chargers, that he picks the right quarterback. Now, I know <laughs> the situation is going to be a little harder because the Dolphins taking Tua. It was kind of like, OK, this is where you're going to go with the situation. But Tom Telesco 
in that one in that one spot where he had to choose a quarterback, he got Justin Herbert. I know some people say, "Well, Justin Herbert fell to him." You know, it worked out because it worked out, yeah. it, it worked out for them. I know a lot of Raider fans don't, aren't going to give Justin Herbert a lot of credit, but let's be honest about Justin Herbert. You know, he is a quality quarterback in this league. And you just hope that Tom Telesco with a top pick can make the right decision when it's time for the race to get on the clock and choose their quarterback. So while it looks grim right now, again, shout out to Raider Nation for hanging in there year after year, week after week. Uh, we're just looking for development and progress at this point. And, and as I said, is this the coaching staff? Is this the right coaching staff to develop your young quarterback in, in an office that's going to need a rebuild in 2025? Absolutely. And I couldn't have said it better myself. So we'll end it there, uh, of course. But Mo, before we head out, I know you got some things coming up this week. Remind everybody where they can catch you between now and when we're back on here on Thursday. Bleacher Report live on Wednesday, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Pacific. As always, I'll have a piece up on Sports Not Wednesday morning. I'll be on TNT Sports with my guy, Coy Wire. We'll probably talk about you know. Won't talk about the Raiders, but maybe we'll talk Devontae Adams and what an update on that situation because Schefter had a had a tweet out that I shared with Scott off air that deserves some discussion and it deserves some uh further analysis. So we'll probably go over that on TNT Sports on Thursday, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. Pacific Time. And of course, I'll be on the Raiders post game on Sunday after they play the Los Angeles Rams. Perfect. And we're going to be back here on Thursday talking to all of you. By the way, if you want to call in, tell us what you think. React to what we said today. React to what the other callers said. 702-900-7869 is the number to be part of the Raider Nation mailbag here on Silver and Black today. Again, we are an Odyssey Sports original podcast. Do us a favor. Subscribe wherever you get your audio. Don't forget to rate and review if you're watching us on video. Also, subscribe there. Hit that notifications bell if you're on YouTube so you know when we have a new video. Or wherever you're watching us, make sure you do that so you can join us as the chat, the live chat during the show is always a blast when it debuts at 9 p.m. on Tuesdays and a little earlier on Thursdays because of Thursday Night Football. So make sure you do that. Mo, my friend, I will see you on Thursday. Take care, Scott. Take care, Raider Nation. All right. For our producer, Mike Robbie, and for Mo Moten, I'm Scott Branson. This has been Silver and Black Today. Again, an Odyssey Sports original podcast. Your video portion brought to you by our good friends at BetUS. Don't forget, you can get 150% sign-up bonus. Oh, yeah. 150% folks, YouTube 150 is the code. YouTube 150 is the code to take advantage of that. So we appreciate uh, their support of the show. Raider Nation, hang in there, keep your heads high, and we will talk to you on Thursday. Bye-bye now.